So what happened? So that for that person who's having the Apple Jacks, you know, at 9 p.m., mm-hmm. you know, a couple hours before they go to bed or whatever, um, they do it once, not a big deal. Two times, not a big deal. But I think what you're saying is that the more you do that, the yeah. more stress you're putting your body under. And how long does it take for that kind of chronic carbohydrate consumption throughout the day to put you in a situation where you're maybe pre-pre-diabetic, pre-diabetic, yeah. and then diabetic? Right. Well, it, it's actually faster than most people would think. Mm-hmm. And I can cite specific studies to support it. There was a paper published on young, healthy, college-aged individuals. So these are the most metabolically bulletproof people you can find, right? Mm-hmm. Think about mm-hmm. the average college student. They're doing all kinds of horrible things to their bodies, and yet they're still reasonably fine. Yeah. So they that just helps helps us put this in perspective. So even the most metabolically immune among us mm-hmm. still had this happen. So over a six day period, they had these individuals just simply overeat carbohydrates mm-hmm. more than they needed, which, as we noted, is essentially zero. But they took the average what they were eating and then just said, "All right, stack on some extra carbs." In just six days, their insulin levels in a fasted state had, if I recall correctly, gone up by about three times. So their fasted insulin had gone up by about three times, but their fasting glucose was still normal. Again, back to this original point that if we just if we had a metabolic view, which was just glucose built, we would miss this. So in as little as a week of a little bit of carb-induced self-abuse, mm-hmm. you can have demonstrable insulin resistance settle in. Yeah, I actually always start these conversations with insulin. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that enables a conversation because most people are just familiar enough to kind of yeah. think they know what it means, but unfamiliar enough that they're going to want to be a little curious. Mm. And so I would, I try to take this kind of holistic view where I say, hey, you are taking a blood pressure medication. You are taking a migraine medication. You are taking a, maybe a fertility medication. Imagine if rather than, and, and that almost enables this view where we look at them all as utterly siloed, unrelated problems because there's a medication for this one, a medication for that one, and for that one. But the reality is all of these are, back to my earlier metaphor, branches coming off the same tree. Mm. And the medication is simply clipping at the branches only for them to grow back because it's an ineffective approach. So to put that another way, all of these medications that we take are only treating symptoms that in this instance of the three I mentioned, what was it, blood pressure, migraines, and I don't know, maybe it was... I don't remember the other one I mentioned. Mm. Infertility. Mm. Um, they're all, they are all to varying degrees manifestations of the same problem. And so to me, that is sobering, but it's also encouraging because as much as a person who's, say, taking these three ju- drugs for these three problems, they're looking at this as almost hopeless. Mm. I'm on this drug for the rest of my life. And indeed, if you are taking a drug to try to solve this, what is a metabolic problem, you will be on it for life. It will never actually solve the problem. And moreover, perhaps the most encouraging of all is that that doesn't require medications, that that just requires lifestyle changes, which is, of course, easier said than done. Tie that back to sexual health. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The metabolic connection to fertility and sexual health is is robust. Mm. Like every problem is, is people listening may think, They're rolling their eyes by now thinking, how many things can Ben connect insulin resistance to? Oh, a lot. And this is another... There's more, but yeah. yeah. So let's start with men, just because male fertility is so much simpler, but it's still critical. Mm. So I would say two things. One, we've already mentioned the connection between um, insulin resistance and erectile dysfunction because of the challenges of a dynamic blood flow change. And if you have a blood vessel that stays insulin resistant, it stays constricted, and if you can't vasodilate, you don't have normal erectile function, so right. erectile dysfunction follows. And then second, testosterone is a hormone that matters tremendously. Right. And we, we hear a lot of buzz lately, appropriately, about how nowadays a 20-year-old's testosterone levels were uh, 20 years ago what it was in a 65-year-old man. Like testosterone levels in men are just plummeting Gosh. in real time. We often, we often have a paradigm that says, man, you've gained weight because you're low T. And testosterone is a fat-burning hormone. Mm. It doesn't want the body to burn fat. It is, in fact, the other way, that if you look at the person who's overweight, the man who's overweight and low testosterone, that's probably a consequence of actually having fat cells that are too big. So one of the quirks of male physiology is that as fat expands, it increases the expression of an enzyme called aromatase, 
Mm-hmm. And aromatase is an enzyme that will take testosterone and convert it into estrogen. Mm-hmm. Most people don't appreciate that all estrogen in men and women was once testosterone. Then the ovaries and the testes will just convert a certain amount of that via this enzyme aromatase. Now, ovaries convert a lot more. So in the female, her testosterone levels are here and her estrogen levels might be about here. Still, testosterone's higher, importantly, gals. In men, it'll be like this because aromatase isn't quite as active. But in the man, his fat cells start to act like her ovaries, where it is now taking the testosterone that the testes are producing, literally pulling it in, having the aromatase rearrange it, clip it apart, and send it back out as estrogen. So he has this one-two effect, this two-part punch, which is, one, depriving him of his testosterone and all the metabolic magic that comes with it, but at the same time, increasing his estradiol, which may be telling his body to store fat in ways that are awkward for the male physique to store, and just not feeling like the testosterone wants him to feel like this big, strong, capable man. Now, so that so low T compromising erectile function and fertility, that there's a huge metabolic component to both erectile dysfunction and then the testosterone reduction itself. In women, polycystic ovary syndrome is the most common form of infertility in women, increasingly common worldwide. Mm. There is an effort actually among fertility specialists to change the name and call it some form of metabolic infertility, yeah. which is a much more accurate yeah. term. So back to this comes back to insulins. One of its many effects is to affect the actions of that enzyme aromatase. And so in a person who is insulin resistant, in this woman, her insulin levels are high, which always accompanies insulin resistance. That enzyme aromatase, which is attempting to convert testosterone into estrogen, gets inhibited by insulin. So when insulin comes to the ovaries, one of its many effects will be to tell aromatase to work less. Mm. Now her ovaries are releasing too much testosterone, which will cause the woman with PCOS to have some of the symptoms like acne or male pattern baldness, which are both testosterone effects. But at the same time, she's not getting sufficient estrogen to promote, to to work with the LH surge, both of which are necessary for ovulation itself. Luteinizing hormone. Yeah, yeah. So you have luteinizing hormone LH from the interior pituitary, which is interacting in a really dynamic way with the ovaries to really overactivate aromatase to release a lot of estradiol or the main estrogen. Both of those are essential for ovulation. The compensatory mechanisms in the body are just wild. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, especially with endocrinology, which is why I love it so much as a science, and especially in the female fertility cycle. It is just this beautiful mass of organization, which looks like chaos, but it's, of course, Mm. intricately well organized. But suffice it to say, when insulin's too high, it disrupts that surge. And as the surge is disrupted, ovulation does not happen. Now, all of these follicles, which had been growing throughout the normal follicular phase, the follicles developed during the follicular phase, one becomes dominant because of the estradiol, the estrogen and the LH surge. And then that is the one that will ovulate. And then once that ovulates and you enter into the luteal phase, which is defined by the corpus luteum, the remnant structure which released the egg, Mm. the ovary has this remnant structure on it. It dictates the signal change to all the other follicles which had been thinking they might be the winner to go away. And so as the ovary was literally expanding in volume, now it shrinks back to normal as all these follicles would have been developing. But if she doesn't ovulate, all of those follicles stick around and now they become cysts and now her ovaries are getting bigger and she goes, she starts going through another cycle and they get even bigger and that can be exceptionally painful. And that explains the, this, the physical pain that a woman may experience with PCOS and her disrupted cycles. But once again, as discouraging as this all is, the good news is that this is something you can grab and change when you acknowledge the metabolic underpinning of this somewhat ambiguously seeming um, form of infertility. 